Get out there. Do it in an SUV you can rely on. With an available 360-degree surround view monitor and the number one compact SUV in initial quality by J.D. Power. Getting out there. It's better in the Hyundai Tucson. Boom. <laughs> Keith Urban just gave two fast-rising country music stars the shock of their lives. Tennille Towns and Riley Green thought they were sitting down to do interviews, but then Keith crashed their Zooms to break big news. Hi. How are you feeling right now? You feel good? Oh yeah, I feel really good right now. <laughs> well, you're about to feel a whole lot better. Congratulations, you are the ACM New Female Artist of the Year, Tennille Towns. Serious? <laughs> oh my God. When do you think you're gonna be playing a show again next? Well, we, we've, uh, <laughs> we, we've dabbled. Would you want to play the ACMs? Maybe as the uh, brand new ACM New Male Artist of the Year? Yeah. Would that be interesting? I think Riley, that's pretty cool. Congratulations. Riley shared his reaction with us today. How are you feeling? I'm good. Let me make sure my phone's off. We get a lot of text messages today. I'm nobody, sure. wanted, nobody wanted to talk to me yesterday, <laughs> and all of a sudden people want to talk to me. It's great. Now I wish I would have got a glass of wine. <laughs> Keith will host the Academy of Country Music Awards live on CBS on September 16th. Take care, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to the KSAT 12 News at 5. We're coming to you from the KSAT newsroom today. First at 5, a woman found dead by her young child at their northwest side home today. And now a murder investigation is underway. Foul play is expected, but police are not saying much more. As Devin Clark explains, neighbors are being less quiet about the situation. A shocking discovery at this northwest side home on Maverick Draw this afternoon. It's where San Antonio police say a mother was found dead by one of her two children, ages five and eight, who then texted their grandmother that something was wrong. So the, the grandmother showed up, found her daughter, 26-year-old female, on the floor as soon as you walk into the door. Investigators are not saying exactly how they believe the woman died, but they did say she was found with significant trauma to her body, and that's what they believe caused her death. None of this surprises me right now. While police say there have been no other calls for the house except for a theft, neighbors say it was hardly quiet, and many times the victim could be heard arguing with the man. Two days ago in the morning, I hear them arguing, and it's not, it wasn't unexpected because he's a hothead. He was very upset with her, like, like, why are you doing this? Like, I've been doing all this for you. Like, kiss, like, kiss my A. Investigators say they are working leads, but they have not named anyone as a person of interest or a suspect. They do believe, though, that will change very soon. Investigators are just, just starting to, to dig in and uh, confident that we'll have this case closed sooner than later. Anyone with any information is asked to call the SAPD Homicide Unit at 210-207-7635. On the northwest side, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Devin. A deputy with the Comal County Sheriff's Office is in the hospital after he was shot while serving a warrant today. It all happened at a home in the 1400 block of Springwood up in Spring Branch. The Sheriff's Office says the deputy was airlifted to University Hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. They did not say who or what the warrant was for, but they are continuing to investigate. A man is recovering after he crashed into an 18-wheeler in South Bear County this morning. It happened just before 1130 in the 12,000 block of South Highway 181 that's near Foster Road, not too far from Calaveras Lake. The sheriff's office says he was rear ended. He was rear ended by the big rig and the impact caused him to hit the windshield. He managed to pull himself out of the car and was taken to Bamsey and is in serious condition. Meanwhile, a man is facing charges after he stabbed another man at his north side home around four o'clock this morning. San Antonio police say the suspect arrived to find the victim inside his home on Hillwood Drive and Blanco Road along with his wife and son. They say the victim ran to hide in the bathroom while the suspect got a knife then stabbed the victim in the head. Although the victim was taken to the hospital, he is expected to recover. The suspect arrested and charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Meantime, we now know the name of the man who was shot to death on the northeast side on Sunday. He's been identified as 27-year-old Calvron Dwight Hardrick. His body was found in a parking lot of Salado Creek Drive near Nacogdoches on Sunday night. San Antonio police believe someone broke into his apartment and he was shot during a confrontation. At last check, no arrests have been made. 
He's accused of firing shots at a group of men earlier this morning. Now he's facing charges. 40-year-old Eric Delgado arrested on a charge of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Arrest records state back on August 8th, Delgado was fighting with a group of men in the 8500 block of Wakefield Drive. During that fight, Delgado pistol whipped one of the men allegedly and fired shots at others before running off. His bond set at $40,000. A historic move for San Antonio City Council. It has passed a resolution declaring racism a public health crisis. The resolution recognizes the city's history of racist practices and laws, saying they have led to inequities in education, housing, health, and economic security as well. The resolution's stated goals is to establish stronger efforts to promote racial equity. The issues have been highlighted in recent weeks following the death of George Floyd. Councilman Clayton Perry abstained from the vote over concern of the resolution's outline being divisive, he said. Councilman Manny Pelias was absent today. Joe Biden will accept the Democratic nomination for president tonight, but before Biden's big speech, Senator Cory Booker, former South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg, California Governor Gavin Newsom, and Senator Tammy Duckworth all slated to appear at the Democratic National Convention. Here's Nadia Romero uh, with a preview of the final night from Delaware. It's a night 32 years in the making. Well, thank you very, very much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you all. Joe Biden will officially accept the Democratic Party nomination for president of the United States after running unsuccessfully in the Democratic primaries in 1988 and 2008. The former vice president is proof the third time is the charm. It's a good night. And the seats be getting even better. Tonight, Biden plans to focus less on the opposition and more about rebuilding and setting the nation on a new path. Given his optimism, I think there's an opportunity for him to give us a vision, his vision of what this country can be if we do prevail in November. Biden's former speechwriter Dylan Lowy anticipates his old boss will use his storytelling abilities to get that message across. There's a very powerful story for him to tell there about the incredible progress that we can make if we're able to, to elect Joe Biden, Kamala Harris. Other speakers to watch, Senator Cory Booker, Pete Buttigieg, Andrew Yang, and Michael Bloomberg, who all ran against Biden during the primaries. I'm encouraging everybody who was part of my campaign to join me because we have found that leader in Vice President, soon to be President, Joe Biden. In Delaware, I'm Nadia Romero. Both political parties, Republican and Democrat, will have to rely on a coalition of voters to win the November presidential election, and that includes Latino voters. Yeah, political scientist at UTSA tells our Jesse Degollado they are each responsible for mobilizing Hispanic voters enough to make a stronger showing than in the past. In appealing to Latino voters, the freshly minted Democratic ticket, as well as the Republican incumbents, are all being reminded. Immigration reform is one issue, but Latinos are more concerned about the economy. Given that the pandemic, she says, has taken a heavy toll on minority communities, so much so. 60% of the Latinos have said that if they see someone at the polls without a mask, they're going to walk away. On top of working class Latinos losing their jobs, many facing eviction. But that's where she says President Trump has the advantage, small though it may be. Trump has a 3% edge on the economic confidence among Latinos. It's why, she says, Biden's camp is pointing out that as vice president, he oversaw the nation's recovery after the 2008 recession. Remember, voters have a short attention span. Perhaps most important, she says, will be educating many Latinos about the voting process, especially mail-in and absentee ballots. There's a lot of miscommunication, a lot of misunderstanding. And when both sides try to sway Latino voters, she says it's still true. You're going to have to recognize that there is no monolithic group when it comes to the Latino population. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. We are doing things just a little bit differently today. Yeah, just there's for some today. gremlins out there. Yeah, a few gremlins <laughs> in our production control, but uh, we are lucky to have this beautiful set yeah. standing by. Luckily to get on what we can at this point. Meanwhile, let's talk to Adam Kasky. Uh, radar showing some storms out there. Yeah, it is. And, you know, we still have all the information that you need here. It may look a little different today at 5 o'clock, but we have everything that you need. We do have some areas of rain off to the west of San Antonio, and this is some 
soaking rainfall, some good rain in some of the most drought stricken parts of South Texas, west of I-35. That's when we're where we're in the most severe and extreme drought. So taking a look at these downpours, which by the way, are really overperforming today. We're just supposed to have a little spritz and sprinkle, but with this northerly flow, sometimes it surprises us. And that's what we have today. Lakey getting lit up with a little bit of lightning thunder and some heavy downpours in and around parts of Lakey. Then you get into Uvalde County as well. Some good rainfall there. Sabinal even stretching just about into Hondo. These downpours all moving north to south and they continue to basically modify as they go through time. These don't always hold together. They pop up, they rain for a while, travel maybe 25, 30 miles and rain themselves out. But we're going to continue to see this activity west of San Antonio through the rest of the afternoon and even into the evening hours. There is a slight chance we could have a few pop up in and around Bear County, especially with a little bit more energy that's off to the north of us getting ready to head south and the typical coastal showers that we often see this time of year, uh, particularly just east of I-37, but we even had a few right along the I-37 corridor in Live Oak County. In terms of actual rainfall, estimates are good in Real County. Look at this, that little green dot right there at the Y of Lakey. That's over an inch estimated by the Doppler radar, and it's not out of the question that rain gauges will get about an inch from some of those downpours where the heaviest ones follow each other. All right, here's the big picture. Same weather pattern as what we've had all week long. Big upper level high far to the west of us. So that our steering flow up above us is coming out of the north. And you've heard us talking about this all week. Whenever we have that northerly flow, the wind coming out of the north up above us, we get these little impulses of energy and sometimes they like to overperform in terms of the rainfall. And this started as just a few little showers in North Texas dissipated, moved southward, then blossomed back up over the Edwards Plateau and Hill Country. We'll take it. And basically from here on out the rest of the week through the weekend and next week, at least slight chances of rain. We have up to 20%, but every day there's at least a 10% chance. Then we get into Saturday and we're up to 20. Tuesday, Wednesday, about a 20% chance as well. Another triple digit day today, 100 the high. Far from the record of 107, but four degrees above the average of 96. Weather watchers right now. Helen's backyard in Seguin, 100, along with Panamaria, Maria, Floresville, 103, Warren and Del Rio, 106. But you see some cooler temperatures, well, not temperatures that aren't as hot. Let's put it that way. Lakey at 90 and Rock Springs, 93. That's the rain cooled air, and we have some outflow boundaries that will be affecting our temperatures as we go through the rest of the evening. Actually, the official reading in Rock Springs now, 79. Meanwhile, you get down to Catula, 102, and Creasel Springs, 100. So those spotty showers will last through about, I think, 9, 10 o'clock, then partly cloudy. Bit of a breeze out there, but not much. Temperatures falling through the 90s, then 80s, and just like we have been, we'll start the day tomorrow in the mid-70s, and then top out right near 100 with a lot of sunshine and just that 10% chance of rain. Looking ahead in terms of temperatures, we'll, I think, shave off a few degrees. Nonetheless, it's still going to be hot near 100, but likely slightly above it once we get into the weekend. And look at this. We have two new tropical depressions to talk about in the Atlantic Basin, one of which is moving into the Gulf of Mexico. I'll have a full update on these at their forecast tracks and spaghetti plots coming right up. Starting to line up there. Yeah, it could get very interesting in the Gulf. We'll be back with Adam in just a bit. Meantime, more news. It's been a big week for the Mays Cancer Center at UT Health. The center was recently renewed in its designation as a National Cancer Center Institute. As well today, it's received more than $10 million in grants from the Cancer Prevention and Research Institute of Texas. That news means that more money will be made available to bring in top of the line cancer researchers as they search for effective treatments and drugs used to battle all types of cancers. The Mays Cancer Center is one of four cancer centers in Texas being recognized by the National Cancer Center. And with today's award, it has awarded more than $15 million to local researchers at the Mays Cancer Center this year. Meantime, school is back in session, but parents, teachers, and students are still trying to figure out what is going to work best in a virtual class setting? We're still trying to figure it out at my house. Yes. Girls Inc. of San Antonio says they can help. They've created a new program designed for girls in grades three through eight and offer resources that for some families may be difficult to access at home. Alicia Barrera with more about this program and how you can sign up. 
Natalie Garza's new classroom is cozy, with splashes of red throughout, and its walls covered with inspirational art. I think the difference might be that you just have to stay on top of it more, especially since you're not in the classroom. You don't get to go to each class. Natalie's mom signed her up for Girls Inc.'s new program, Smart Eye Cafe. The program provides a safe and supervised environment for virtual learning, such as Natalie's online courses at the Young Women's Leadership Academy. I guess since at my house, it's kind of like hectic. It's just like hard to find like a quiet place to do online school. We can help with homework, assignments, logging in, and then when school's done for the day, whether that's half a day, three o'clock, we have space so we can have fun and we can, you know, do things that just engage the girls with others, with friends, with, you know, new friends in a safe space. Leo Rosenauer, Girls Inc. president and CEO, admits there have been a few hiccups. You know, some connectivity issues, some um, what's our password, what class are we supposed to be in, um, how do I log on to this platform. But Natalie says the staff has been extremely helpful especially when it comes to school software. I never really met the teacher and I we started using Canvas, which is a new like app instead of Google Classroom. Canvas was kind of hard to figure out, so one of the staff had to help me find like my notes for Spanish since we could only be on Zoom for a certain amount of time. For those that don't have a device, Girls Inc. says they'll work closely with schools and districts to make sure the girls have what they need to be strong, smart, and bold. It's going to be okay. Great program. That was Alicia Moneta reporting. We'll be right back with more on the News at 5. This could be one of the most interesting hurricane seasons ever. We've got so much happening in the Gulf. We need the rain, yeah. so we're kind of egging it on, but it could get real Interesting. And this is a time of the year when things really start to get active, Adam. And right now, even on our own radar, we've got some showers out there today. Yeah, we do. We have some areas of rain completely unrelated to any tropical activity. We'll take a close look at the two new tropical depressions that we have in the Atlantic Basin. But another quick recap of the radar. Some active spotty showers west of San Antonio. These will be persisting and really coming and going, but traveling north to south over the next about two two to four hours is what I would say. The activity along the coastline, it's not gonna last quite as long. That usually rains itself out pretty quickly. So let's talk about the tropics here. We've got these two systems we're watching. One still out in the Atlantic, the other in the Caribbean. Notice a little closer to the Gulf of Mexico. And that's the one that's, that could potentially affect Texas. But let's start focusing on Tropical Depression 13. And by the way, when these get names, they'll be Laura and Marco. Okay, those are the name, the next names that'll be uh, on tap here. So it just depends on which one gets to the Tropical Storm Strength first, and that's the name it'll get. Uh, tropical Depression 13, this one out in the Atlantic, tracking to the west, likely to basically passed just north of Puerto Rico, moved toward the Florida Straits. That's by the end of the weekend and early next week and potentially become a category one hurricane affecting anywhere from Cuba to Florida, maybe even the west coast of Florida. That would be by Monday, Tuesday of next week. The odds of that making it anywhere near Texas slim to none, but we're tracking the other system even more closely. This is Tropical Depression 14. Still a weak system, of course. Max sustained winds at 35 miles per hour. It's going to have some land to contend with. That never helps in terms of uh, strengthening these storms. It works against them and keeps them weaker. So likely to be a tropical storm and remain that even into the weekend, Saturday 1 p.m., interacting with the Yucatan Peninsula and some upper level wind shear. Right now, it's still expected to be a tropical storm as it would near somewhere along the Texas or Louisiana coastline by Monday, Tuesday time frame, especially Tuesday. And right now, I think the highest probability would be anywhere from Houston eastward toward New Orleans. I think that's going to be the general trend of this forecast path that you see. You know how we often see them start inching one way or another. Right now, I think the indications are this is going to start inching eastward, but of course, we'll keep you updated and let you know as we get all the uh, updates from the Hurricane Center. Here are the spaghetti plots, actually pretty tightly packed for Tropical Depression 13. That would be the one affecting Florida. Whereas for us, look at this big spread in the computer models over the Gulf of Mexico. 
It's better than yesterday though. Yesterday, remember we popped this on the screen, it was a 700 mile difference. Well, now it's just a 600 mile difference in the computer models here in terms of where this would be by Tuesday. And the reason we show you this is just to indicate the extreme uncertainty right now in terms of the path of that system. 100, that was our high temperature today. We're feeling the heat again, but far from our record of 107. Right now we're at 97. We have a little extra cloud cover out there and a dew point of 54, so not overly humid. And you see these little areas of rain cool there, especially Rock Springs at 79 right now, even 91 in Fredericksburg and Junction. Dew points, not too bad. We're not really sticky outside right now, but that humidity returns tomorrow. You're going to notice it late tonight and especially first thing tomorrow morning, 75 and humid, 100 and sunny tomorrow afternoon with that very slight chance that off off chance of rain a 10 percent shot saturday a 20 percent chance and in the upper 90s and partly cloudy this weekend again next week's forecast hinges a lot on where that tropical depression and soon to be tropical storm really ends up in the gulf of mexico if we're lucky it's a weak system and we'll throw some rain our way i just think that's unlikely right now well we'll keep hoping for that we yes we need it thank you adam all right greg simmons will be back with sports next After missing the playoffs for the first time in 23 seasons, the Spurs find themselves part of the NBA draft lottery tonight, only the second time since Greg Popovich became the head coach of the Spurs. In 1997, the Spurs' odds of winning the lottery back then were 21.6%, and they used it to select Tim Duncan eventually. Five NBA championships later, we'd say it paid off pretty well, even though the Celtics coach at the time, Rick Pitino, was willing to trade his entire team to get the number one pick in Duncan. The Spurs have only been a lottery team three times since it began in 1985. The other two times, 1987, when they won number one and selected David Robinson, of course. 1989, winning number three position to select Sean Elliott. The track record is very good. Tonight, Spurs chairman Peter John Holt will represent the Spurs at the ceremonies like his father, Peter M. Holt, did back in 1997. And here are the odds for the draft that favor at least three teams at the top, including, of course, the Golden State Warriors at 14%, Cleveland at 14%, Minnesota at 14%, Atlanta a little bit further back at 125 and Detroit at 10.5% to win that number one position. The Dallas Cowboys dealing with issues to two of their players on the offensive line during training camp today. Right tackle Lael Collins was involved in what is being described as a minor car accident on the way to the star in Frisco this morning. He appears to be okay, but seven-time Pro Bowl left tackle Tyron Smith had to leave the field with an undisclosed injury. Cornerback Jordan Lewis also went down with what appears to be a left ankle injury. One thing we learn as training camp started, thanks to Amari Cooper, is that Dak Prescott has built a football field in his own backyard, and Prescott says it was the COVID-19 pandemic that made it happen. I've always dreamed about uh, having a football field in my backyard, so um, that was something that I kind of kind of put the foot down and said, hey, let's get it going. Um, it, can give me some, it can give me somewhere every offseason, or um, you can't plan for things like this, but when things like this come around, I'll just be able to have it, and it's obviously private access, and we can get the work we need. Former Dallas Cowboy Des Bryant has left his trial with the Ravens in Baltimore without a deal. Now, that's according to ESPN that says the team could still add the 31-year-old wide receiver at any point. The three-time Pro Bowler is trying to make a comeback in the NFL after being cut by the Cowboys two years ago. Has not had a, been able to play in a game since December 2017. Bryant arrived in Baltimore on Monday, but had to wait two days to test for the coronavirus before trying out today. Georgia State quarterback Mikel Colasurda has announced on Twitter that he has been diagnosed with a heart condition after he contracted COVID-19 will not be able to play at all this season. It's an enlargement of the heart that is called myocarditis that led to the Big Ten shutting down for the fall after five of their players contracted that exact same disease. We'll have more after this.